I want to say thank you to our sponsors, jobleads.io. With jobleads.io, you can transform your recruiting outreach. What it does, it enriches job board leads with hiring manager contact information to save time, energy, and money. So join the game changers in recruitment today. Visit jobleads.io for a revolution in recruiting outreach and use code Benjamin10 for 10% off for your first three months. Just a few quick things before we jump on this exciting episode. First of all, the Recruiting Growth Summit is live. Registration is in the link below. Check it out. We are finalizing everything over the next week, but it is going to be January 15th through the 19th. We're going to have 10 awesome speakers sharing about how to set your in 2024 and make it the best year yet. So make sure to sign up. I'm excited about this episode of the Elite Recruiter Podcast. I have my special guest, Donnie Gumpton from the Relevant Recruiter, to talk about how to actually be relevant in today's market. I, the game has absolutely changed. Like it is what, what us recruiters are doing five years ago, us, what us recruiters were doing 10 years ago, and what re us recruiters were doing even two to three years ago or even six months ago, it's, it's different now. The game's changed. And we have Johnny on here to talk about how you can level up and be relevant in your niche and relevant in your industry. So welcome to the podcast, Johnny. Thank you, Benjamin. I'm excited to be here, man. Appreciate the invite and hope I can drive some value to your audience here. Awesome. So this will be fun. Yeah. Because like, I mean, I hate, I, I hate to say this. I'm going to get this started off this way. Like, I did not want to post anything on social media. I didn't want to put myself out there. I just always wanted to be known for the hard work and the positions that I filled. But I had to learn. And, you know, saw some of your stuff out there that I had to, I hate to say this, be relevant. Yep. <laughs> So ex excited for you to share on all this stuff, but Rick, let's get started. How did you even get started in the recruiting space? Yeah, man. Um, thanks. Great question. I, th I think this is a, you know, well, we just interviewed you on my show and I think your answer is very similar to <laughs> like most people stumbled into this space. Um, so, you know, real quick backstory. I was, uh, I owned a business with my dad. We were in the floor covering industry, um, had a lot of success growing his business. We went from under a million to over 6 million in the three year span. So I've always had a passion for growing business. Um, and you know, as our business grew, it became blaring clear for me. Like I didn't want to be working with the consumer that way. I did not want to be in the floor covering industry, but I've always had a passion to coach and help people. And so uh, I was working with a coach at a, at a time and I'm like, man, I really want to be a coach. And I just like, boom, all right, let's go. Naturally, I was going after other home improvement and retail type companies like I was. And the market just wasn't there for me yet. And I was in a, um, an executive forum. If you've ever heard of Renaissance, uh, I was in a Renaissance executive group and one of the guys in the group owned a staffing firm focused on engineers in the Bay area. And so I actually just started helping him with stuff and trying some of my tactics. And then he's like, man, this stuff's good. This works. And then boom, the rest was history. So then I started to kind of dig like, ah, I think there's an opportunity here as I started to look at, you know, this was six years ago now, like, look at how the market was approaching people. And I'm like, yeah, this is where I want to plant my flag. And so here we are six years later. I think it's super funny because like, if you look at recruiting, if you look at a lot of other, like, you know, very forward markets out there, like recruiting is like always a decade or two behind oh, yeah. everybody else. Like, I think while other companies are using drip campaigns and marketing and other industries, that was like the norm. Like recruiters were just like, I think it was like DSP was like, think about this, a drip campaign. And we're all like, what? <laughs> like, you mean I don't have to send it like the message and then go back and resend that person a message? But like, that's like, but that's, I see that even today. Okay. So many recruiters are just still operating like it was 1980. Oh, for sure. And I, you know what I, I feel like is I feel like the, uh, because it's always been a very heavy outbound, you know, industry, right? Like that's where success comes is being on the phone. And especially, you know, if you go back for some of the real season vets in the space, like that's what they, what they know, but it's interesting having conversations with people. And I think the, what I see is like the marketing part becomes optional and it's like, well, if you go into every other industry in the world, marketing is a part of like the org structure, but for whatever reason, the staffing and recruiting industry, it's like, ah, marketing, eh, we'll just throw that aside. You know, I was like talking to a lady a couple of weeks ago and she was exactly that shit. Oh, I don't want to mark. And I'm like, well are you serious about having a business? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, then it's not a matter if you want to, you need to. Right. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, I mean, as a recruiter, like I, I didn't want to put myself out there. I didn't want to like do all of that stuff. I just wanted to like 
let me fill roles. But then like, if you start thinking about this outside of, you know, I, at least I started to see like, not everybody was picking up the phone anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now, like not everybody was answering every email. Yeah. Like, like how, like, Donnie, how do you be relevant and how do you get past the noise? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, I mean, to, to, to start this off, I mean, I think the game is still always won on the phone, right? Like, I think it's just a matter of how do we get there in a more efficient manner, right? Because, yeah, if you were to look at cold calling, hey, does it work? Yeah, it works. I mean, but I could also drive a taxi to New York. That would work too, right? Um, so I can pick a jet plane or I can pick a taxi, right? I can pick 100 cold calls or I can drip campaigns or automation, right? So I think the the thing is, is just looking at it from a standpoint of, you know, where is, where's, what is the trend? And so when you're looking at cold calling, it's like, well, now look at what it takes to get through. If you were just to call support for, you know, your most recent purchase, how many buttons you have to push to get through somebody. Right. So now we're going to go try to get into organizations and cold call. It's like, just not as efficient out there. So, you know, what my, my, where I saw the opportunity in the industry is purely attraction, right? How do we, how do we put ourselves out there? Uh, as an authority, as a relevant figure in my industry, and then attract people into me rather than trying to bust down the door. But the end goal is the same. I need to get on the phone with a, with somebody who's interested in, in so I can help them do business. And and I think the best companies out there are finding ways to infuse all best practices, right? They're not hard on like, we well, don't cold call. It's like, no, they do some sort of outreach, right? Um, we don't market. No, they, they've got marketing, right? And I think that's where, you know, kind of talking again is like having all aspects of a business, um, you know, be a part of the, of the recruiting space. Okay. And you, you mentioned about attraction. So like, like we we're talking earlier, everything's been outbound. Everything has been like hunt, 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 hunt. Yep. What are some of the things that a recruiter can do to bring in leads that are attracted to you? Like coming in yep. semi inbound. Yep. So I think the very first thing here, and this is, you know, may not hit home with everybody, but some is like, you have to have a target client, uh, especially if you're trying to attract. When I'm on the phone, I can tailor my message to whoever's on the other end. When I'm in the digital world and I'm online, I can't change my message based off of who's viewing it, right? And so it's very important to know, hey, if I'm trying to attract an audience, I need to know who I'm attracting. You know, I always use fishing as my analogy, which is like, hey, if I'm gonna go fishing, nobody ever goes and fishes and says, oh, I'm just gonna go fish and hope I catch whatever. Right now, it's like, usually you go to a pond and you have an idea of what kind of fish might be in that pond. And then you're going to go show up with the right bait to catch that fish. Well, marketing branding is not a whole lot different. It's like, okay, so if I want to do focus on attraction, I need to know who I'm trying to attract first. So I need to have my target market. Then well, what are their pains, problems, frustrations? How can I speak to them in a way that the average recruiter is not? And, and what I mean by that is I'm not just trying to transact. I'm not just trying to put a most viable candidate in front of you, which is a great marketing approach. I'm not saying it's not. But I'm trying to show up and be different than the next person out there. And that comes with, hey, I need to know my market inside now. So that's the first foundational thing. The next from there is, well, I need to know, I need to drive awareness that I exist. Any small business owner um, and even recruiter is, we all struggle with obscurity. Is there enough people in our market that know that we're there to help them? And so, again, I have that clear market that I know who I want to help. I want to package myself with my digital presence to be an obvious solution to them. And then I need to expose myself to as many as people as I possibly can. And then the last part of this that I really believe in, and I don't want to say the last part, but the next part will go in, <laughs> is just creating the content, right? The content really drives the relevancy, drives the differentiation, um, and it expands the reach of, of your audience. Um, and then through, you know, and this is where I call up the, the good news and the bad news. Benjamin is when you get into creating content, you know, the good news is, is it's going to be tough. So people are going to fall off. The bad news is, is it's going to be a tough. And so most people, because, Hey, I can pick up the phone all day long and have evidence of success. But if I'm creating content, you know, this, there's a lot of blind faith in that journey for a while. Not a people are, you know, if you get into the dopamine metrics of likes, comments, impressions, well, when you first start, you usually don't get validated very much. Uh, for me, I don't focus on that as much and more into like attracting, you know, an actual, what I would call an inbound lead, but that takes time too, because there's not a magical piece of content. What you're doing is you're making yourself relevant. It takes time for you to become relevant where somebody goes, you know, 
there's very few pieces of content that generate the con generate the lead as much as the individual behind the content is what's generating the lead. And what, I mean, what I've seen like 2023, 20, going into 2024, the impact of social selling. Yeah. And the, the algorithm, I am, I hated the change in the algorithm for LinkedIn. I was like, I hated these like LinkedIn bros and memes and stuff like that. I'm yep. like, no, that's not what this is for. This yep. is for work. But now we start playing to the algorithm and I saw those people like they're with their businesses growing. I'm like, well, fuck. It's, it's, you can beat them, join them, right? <laughs> you can be rich or you can be right. You pit, right? Absolutely. But so you're, you're now throwing this hat on. Like I need to start creating this content that's relevant for, for my target market. What are some of the things and like, like, what are you putting out there to be relevant? Mm, yeah, it's a great question. So I actually kind of go high level on this real quick is I kind of focus on three pillars. The first pillar that I focus on is leadership. And so the question you can actually ask yourself, because these are what I ask myself to prompt I content ideas. Well, how can I lead my market today? And so what that looks like is like, well, what are the, what are the pains, problems, frustrations, mistakes, challenges that your hiring leaders or candidates and your, you know, are going through? How can you start to create content that showcases that you have solutions for that? You know, some of that could be just, you know, something very granular. Some of that can be more big, high level process stuff. But if I'm going to start to speak to their pains and problems, then they're going to immediately go, oh, Benjamin knows what the heck's going on with government contracting. He knows what's going on with the cybersecurity space. He knows he's got a clue because I can see the way he's, he's, he's talking. Okay. But then the other part of the leadership, and this is, I think, gosh, if I took one thing away from this, this is where it's at, is you have to solve this challenge. Why should I listen to you? I'm scrolling the feed. There's hundreds of other thousands of other recruiters out there. There's even other recruiters in your niche that are out there that are going to be creating content. So why am I going to stop scrolling the feed? Listen to you. Proven track record of success. I've been there. I've done it. Okay. And so, um, being able to showcase and share how you're winning, sharing client and candidate testimonials, sharing your open positions, not from, Hey, I'm trying to get the best talent, but from more of a branding and relevancy. Hey, I told you I'm the best in the cover of contracting space. Let me go ahead and share that I have these open positions. So that's the leadership pillar. So real, real, real quick, stopping yeah. on that. So I, most of us like recruiters that have been on LinkedIn since the good old days of, I think I was on there since like 2004, like it, we always shared, Hey, here's our open positions. Like that, I feel like that isn't working anymore. So are you sitting there saying we should share open positions, but also like talk about the positions we're closing and talk about all that stuff? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, okay. here's what I say. So yeah, and you bring up a great point. No, it's not like checking the box. Exciting new opportunity, <laughs> right? So one of the home runs that we found is you share your open position, but you do it from a branding. Yeah, I'm putting my branding and marketing hat on. I'm not putting my recruiting hat on. I'm not, I have no care in the world that I'm going to share this position and I attract a client or a candidate from it. That's not, you know, most of the clients I'm working with are hunters and that's what they pride themselves on. But what I can do is I can turn it into a LinkedIn slideshow and then I can put my branding behind it. I can put my personality behind it. And I can put three graphics and I can be more of a marketer and brander. And I can say, are you looking for your next cybersecurity opportunity? And then go to the next slide and here's perks of this company. Here's perks of this opportunity. Here's how you're going to expand and talking, you know, I think one of the areas that uh, I see recruiters make a mistake is like, here's a new sales position. Here's what you're going to do as a salesperson. It's like, oh, well, no shit, huh? Like, I didn't know what I was going to do in sales and since I'm in sales. Like, well, what's going to get them excited and attracted, right? So we just do these slideshows from a branding standpoint. So yeah, it's sharing the job, but it's not from like any other point other than marketing, right? And then I'm going to share with you, I have success. Oh, I love getting messages from, you know, like this, and I'm going to screenshot my testimonial, or I'm going to take my LinkedIn recommendation. I'm going to put it out there, but it, I'm going to highlight my prospect so that that way I don't look like I'm pretentiously bragging or something like that. Right. I'm sure everybody else's success and story, so to speak. And when you say slideshows, are you talking about LinkedIn carousels? Carousels. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For the listeners, like the, like. Don't laugh. I couldn't figure out how to do a carousel for the longest time. I feel like I'm not the most tech savvy person out there. Yeah. And the people run circles around me. But like for me, Canva makes this pretty easy. Where, what, what do you yep. use? Yep. Canva, 100%. Just make, keep it simple. Go to Canva. You know, yeah. um, you can create a template slideshow. I mean, it's literally grab your colors from your website, grab your logo, put some text, 
you create one template one time every time you get a job posting to them, just part of your process. You create that same template where it's just like, I'm going to slap and grab and put a testimonial on there. And you're probably going to Canva, put in a testimonial slide, put your colors, your logo behind it and boom. And now you're, it's low hanging fruit content, right? Like there's no effort in creating that. It's basically taking whatever's happening congruent in your day and then showcasing that. And so, real, real quick before we move on on that. So like most of us recruiters or a lot of us recruiters have worked at these large staffing agencies that had these entire like communications, marketing departments that were spending so much time mm -hmm. putting this stuff out. There's now great companies like Canva where you can literally go toe to toe with oh, yeah. branding. And then these big hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollar, million dollar like marketing budgets. Yep. Yep. Oh, well, I mean, it's, there's so much more available to us now as individual, you know, small businesses, independent recruiters, boutique recruiting agency owners, like wherever you put it, like you can compete with anybody now with the tools and technology that's available. I mean, it's not in, in, if you're not thinking that way, then it's just because you're not, it's kind of one of those things we don't know. We don't know, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely create a presence for yourself and utilize tools like Canva and all the other AI stuff that's out there to start showing up. Um, and it's one of those things that like, uh, it depends on how, how bad you want it. Right. But like, this isn't an option anymore. If you're serious about truly building a solid recruiting agency, you know, and you don't have 20 years of, of client relationships. If you think you're just going to kind of do a bunch of outbound now, and you're going to be good, kind of flying under the radar, you know, you, you could win, but the person who's out there like a sore thumb, that's driving their own brand narrative and things like that's going to win that much more. You know, and we can expose ourselves way more now, you know, um, using more modern approaches than we can, you know, with kind of the old, old school approaches. So, so is there any other like, uh, recommendations that you would say to be like bringing out that relevant content for that? Yeah. Yeah. So there's actually two other pillars I want to dive into the other, the next pillar is the service pillar. And this is, I think, kind of traditional content marketing, which is more Here's your tips. Here's your tricks. Here's your how to's. Here's busting through myths and things like that. So getting in the habit of like, Hey, here's three interviewing tips. But here's the thing is like, if you were to follow my stuff on LinkedIn, most of my posts are talking about recruiting, recruiting agency owners, recruiting entrepreneurs. And I do that strategically because I don't care about anybody else on LinkedIn. I'm not saying that in a bad way, but like I have one objective, which is to capture their attention. So I'm going to talk to that audience every single day. And I think this is where a lot of recruiters don't do that is they create content, but it's vague. And so I don't know who, who you're, who are you creating it for? Right. Um, and so, you know, but being able to really add value to your industry puts you into a position of goodwill, makes you more of a resource and not just transactional. Um, and so that's the next pillar. And then the last one is, and you kind of talked about this before is, is, you know, uh, what I, I call it the connection pillar, which is putting a little bit of your personal self out there. And there's two reasons that I really recommend this. One is that unfortunate algorithm <laughs> is when you put, I mean, I can tell you 10 times out of 10, if I post a picture of my wife and I, or if I post a picture of my son, the impressions go like crazy. Then I'll go drop a ton of value. And it's like, does anybody want reading this thing? You know, and so it's like kind of just hacking game in the system a little bit. But the other thing, and this is in my opinion, that's more important now than ever is there's AI, there's Chad GBT, there's all this stuff out there. I want to connect with real human beings and authenticity is absolutely key. And so I, you know, Hey, I can go into AI all day long and I can create articles and I can add value. I can create my leadership content. I can create my service content, but you can't create my connection content. You can't replace the experiences that I'm having in life. And so by sharing and showcasing that, that makes me real, makes me authentic. It makes me more attractive to people because. I can't tell you any people, times people come to a call and be like, oh man, you're an Irish fan. Oh, you know, just by watching videos and seeing what's in the background or listening to things I'm talking about. Or recently I've been talking about, I just went to a concert, a tool concert, took my son, posted about it. People are on the call like, hey man, I saw you went to the tool. That's awesome. You know? So, and I believe that people do business with people that they know, like, and trust, right? So, you know, we don't have the same commonalities all, all the time for you to know, like, and trust me, but you can get an idea of who I am as a person. And I think that that's how people are making decisions now. This is 2023. Nobody's buying brands and logos. We are buying people now more than ever. So I, I love that. Cause if you think about it, when you're shopping, like you, it, people buy stories. Yeah, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's why even some of like the car companies now go into the stories of like the cute puppy that could save. It's not because it's the car company. It's the story and the emotional, like 
Yep. The li- LinkedIn algorithm right now is playing on the emotion. Yep. Well, it, it, and that's one last thing. So if you aren't creating yet, the lowest hanging fruit, easiest place for you to start is actually telling stories. And I always ask people this. It's like, Benjamin, have you had any calls with clients or candidates this week? Yeah. Okay. So on any of those calls, did you give any advice to them? Uh, I mean, I try to look at things as, as a consultant. So we're always a kind of like trying to add value, even if it's not a placement. Boom. There's your content. So whatever they found value on the call is going to be valuable to the next prospect. Just finished up a call with a, you know, cybersecurity professional. They asked me if they should redo their LinkedIn profile based off this new job they're applying for. And I told them X. And so okay. what you're doing is, is you can't replace people's experience. You can't place stories, right? So, and this is shifted, right? So a couple of years ago, like the big how you thing was big, right? That's kind of what everyone's like, hey, here's how you should do this, how you should do that. Well, if I said, hey, Benjamin, you know, here's how you can lose weight using the carnivore diet. And I were to lay out three bullets for you. You could take a look at all three of those bullets and you can go, yeah, that ain't going to work. Nope. That's not it for me. But if I just simply shifted that title and I said, Hey, Ben, here's how I lost weight on the carnivore diet. Then just by that subtle tweak, you can't challenge it anymore. It's my experience. Hmm. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. So if I show up to the market and I'm like, Hey, you know, here's how I just helped one cybersecurity company fill four roles. Hey, I'm immediately relevant, calling up my target market. I'm sharing a, a experience. I'm sharing something that they can relate with. And, you know, depending on how good I'm at, I'm at storytelling, the more emotion I can drive. So, but that's loving you pure content right there for you. Just tell stories, tell, tell what's happening in your day every day. That's definitely a good shift. So, and here's the thing. I think a lot of recruiters sometimes like go all in on one thing and kind of forget the basics. Yeah. You're, you've gotten a chance to coach a lot of like high level entrepreneurs, a, high, a lot of high level top building recruiters. What does their work ethic look like mm. with creating content? And also their work ethic with everything else that they're doing. Yeah. Well, I think, I think they have a mindset of, it's like, first and foremost, it's like an auto option, right? They, they, they have clarity of commitment, right? Like we're committed to this. This is what I'm doing. So I think with anything, doesn't matter if you're marketing content, whatever, it's like having clarity of action is most important. What am I trying to, what am I trying to achieve? So the first thing was like, well, what's your, are you committed to posting three times a week, five times a week? All right, cool. How you go about doing that is I think where you need to be playful. Okay. And, and one of the things I do as a coach is like, I don't have a cookie cutter, one size fits all. What works for Benjamin is not going to work for Donnie necessarily. Right. And so I think for those, it's like, well, some of my clients, when it comes to the content execution really comes into, they do it daily, they're disciplined. So they schedule it. It's on their calendar. Right. So they're intentional about it. So that you write that one down, be intentional, put it in your calendar. I usually would recommend if you're going to do that, do that first thing in the mornings when we're usually most energetic, right? And then for, for recruiters, it kind of, I get to check the box and I can go do my job now, right? So boom, I've, I've used my creative energy. I've created my content. It's out in the day. Now keep in mind, content's working for me. So if I put it in the algorithm, usually the best time to post on this platform like LinkedIn is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays in the morning. Then I send that thing out there and now I go to work and I have content working for me throughout the day. Right. So that's one approach. But then I have other people that are like, man, there's no way I just, I don't work that way. So the other option is, well, then carve out two hours on Friday, pick your time from 8 a.m. to 10. You don't take any other calls. You don't do anything else. It's blocked off. It's sacred, right? You hold this meeting as serious. You would, you a prospective client and you go create content for the next week. And then you get yourself a batch of content. Now, I mean, with AI and chat GPT and stuff like that, now it's pretty, impo- pretty hard not to do these things. You just want to make sure you're personalizing it because those things are very robotic, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's kind of, that's the approach. I think there's a very clear intention, you know, that they have about doing it. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, th- that's, that's it for the content side. Okay. And like uh, we're now going, shifting a little bit over to AI. So AI is freaking amazing. I know yep. you've done some great trainings on chat GPT and some other AI products. How do you add your voice to AI? Phenomenal question. So I think you have kind of two ways to do about it. And, and I think that this, I could scroll LinkedIn. I could tell you what's, what's a chat GPT post right away. And you probably <laughs> so can I? Right? 
And the first thing is it usually comes with a lot of emojis. So if you're using a bunch of emojis, like, yeah, they're, they're strategic, but if your chat GPT for whatever reason spits out so many emojis when you create them. Um, so I think there's two work processes here. One is, and the best one is usually like use chat GPT. Um, and we can go down a rabbit hole, so I'm going to keep it high, high level here, but you know, create one thread where the thread can then learn kind of how you're going to prompt it. The thread will get smarter. Okay. But what my process for best practice is like, send the prompt, copy and paste the result, go to Google doc and then make it Benjamin's right. So take, take the outline, take the format of whatever, it, you know, created for you and then go put your little personal touch on it. Because again, most of the time, um, these things, uh, just spit out something very robotic. Now there's another play that's a little bit more challenging if you can do it right, which is you can actually get chat GBT to evaluate your brain voice and tone. So what you would do for this is go take three to five posts that you've already written hundred percent yourself, go ask chat GBT if it can evaluate your brain voice and tone. If you give it content, it'll respond back with yes and give you some prompts. And then you go put your content in there and it'll read it. And it'll read all these things. And then, then it'll say, you know, then, then go give it a prompt then go give it something new to do and then evaluate it. And then you can give it feedback. So when I started doing this, they would like, it always comes back with super big words and I'm not, we talked about writing before. Right. So I'm like, Ugh, I don't use words like that. <laughs> so like, I've literally given it feedback, like awesome. The brand voice and tone, we're getting close. I never use words like blank, blank, and blank. Please never use that in my brain voice. And it's like, awesome, we've got that as a note. And then it's like, uh, you know, then you can give it a little, little bit different, you know, course correction. But here's the thing that I've found to be golden with chat GPT, okay, is download the app on your phone and actually give it a chat. Oh my gosh. If you get, if you feed that thing, it's unreal. So I've actually got a brain voice thing now that, um, I don't even have to go adjust it. It's got me so figured out that like it, I can basically almost verbatim copy and post these things now. So when it comes to using chat GPT, every time you start a new chat, you have to reteach it. Are you going back and just in like some of your old chats and continuing that or yeah, I have a, I have a thread that's just called Downey's brand voice. And then, okay. I just go in there and just, that's where I create my content. And that's, you know, <laughs> When I first started doing chat GPT, kind of learning the tool, you know, like that's one of the things if you haven't gone down is like have different threads for different themes, right? So like you can have a, a like my brain voice is where I'm going to create all my contact. Then I have a podcast thread where it's like, I will ask the podcast thread, like, Hey, create me the description for this to write me a summary for my guests. Give me questions for this type of a podcast episode. So it's all kind of learning that. And then I have my YouTube one, which is like, you know, so that. I have different themes for my chat threads, but yeah, it gets smarter once you go down. Okay, cool. So yeah, for the listeners, make sure you're using like one thread the entire time and not starting a brand new chat because you literally have to reteach the AI yep. everything over again if, for every single time you start off. So yep. a lesson I had to learn. I'm like, but I thought I just used it yesterday. No, yep. I did, but I had to go back to that conversation. Yep. Well, Bard, if you haven't played around with Bard much is got its own kind of use case, um, where, you know, Bard, I love chat GPT for more of like the content creation where Bard is, you know, where you should be putting that hat on is like, when do you need like internet research information? So a, a couple of use cases is like, you can go into Bard and say, find me companies that are hiring cybersecurity professionals in Washington, DC, and then it'll list out all the companies. And then you say, okay, well, give me more companies that are small to medium sized businesses and boom, 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 boom. It'll actually lay out all the people that are actually hiring. You know, you can then go in and say, well, what publications do cybersecurity professionals read? And then it'll give you all the publications. So now I can start to be a real true resource for my market, right? Then I can go take me the most recent episode or most recent, uh, edition of the CFO magazine and Give me a summarize of what was in that magazine. And you have the summary of what was in that magazine. Then it'll get, you could take one of the parts of that summary and say, elaborate on this specific article that they wrote. And then like, so I just did this with a client that's a CFO, you know, accounting and finance recruiter. And the amount of information they got in like a five minute set of prompts to be able to go be a resource for the market was like mind blowing, mind blowing, because they basically got this whole article in a synopsis for them 
And, you know, it's like your you massive value add. So then the last one, and this one's gold right here, is uh, I use for outreach kind of a, 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 a framework that I learned, um, which is like uh, hook, relate, um, bridge, and then ask. And um, uh, so I go into chat GPT, or excuse me, bar, and I will say, give me relevant um, stats around hiring, recruiting, and employment in XYZ industry, I'm going to use these for hooks for emails. And then what they'll do is it'll come back and it'll prompt, give you like certain different stats. And then you can go use that. Like, Hey, according to uh, Ford, 75% of CFOs are saying that, you know, hiring talent is more challenging than ever. There's your hook. A lot of the CFOs I'm working with are telling me blame, right? And so you can get so many good ideas because Bard pulls from the inter internet where ChatGPT has some limitations with that. So, wait, so you're telling, working with some of your clients and they're using Bard and you're saying, find me these open positions in XYZ industry in this city and Bard creates a list. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go to the sales navigator, you add those companies as accounts, you go find the hiring decisions based on those uh, hiring decision makers for those accounts and begin your outreach. Well, shit. There, there's, there's another uh, great tip for the listeners, guys. <laughs> I have not, and my next, and before you were going down this rabbit hole that I am now, my mind is blown because I didn't realize it did that. Yeah. It's pretty awesome, man. And I, I, yeah, I've been geeking out with it a little bit lately and, um, it's, it's pretty special. What's your, between chat GPT, Bard and Claude, what are your favorites? What's your favorite? So I haven't really played with Claude very much. You know, I, I really, one of the things I try my best not to do is chase shiny objects, right? So like I got into chat GPT, I'd already been doing Jasper before that. And quickly I realized that like chat GPT kind of replaced Jasper for me. Like, all right, cool. Jasper was sunsetted. We're going chat GPT. Poor I definitely really got caught into Claude just because like it just didn't, you know, just I was already using another one. Right. And I don't want to. I mean, I could, we could try AI tools every week if we want to do, right? So there's something new coming every week. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the only reason I kind of gave Bard a, a chance because it was free and I just kind of tried that. That was kind of the next one that showed up. And then I started to really kind of just look at the logic every time I was prompting chat GPT for stuff or information. It was like, oh, we only go back to 2021 in March, right? And then it's like, oh, okay, well, Bard doesn't. And then it was, then I just kind of started playing around with clients and I'm doing support and I'm like, well, hey, let's see if we can figure it out. And it's like, you know. And that's the thing that I will say is like, have fun with these tools. I don't even use Google search anymore. And in fact, in fact, I think if you're using Google search, you're wasting your time. I mean, because Google search, Bard's going to do all the heavy work. You don't have to do the actual search. Google search is going to build you the search. You got a hundred pages you can go through and be like, Hey, find me. I just give you a use case. Find me uh, a great computer for live streaming. Uh, we were talking about this before. I just bought a computer. And it just did all the work for me. Here's three I recommend. Like, oh, okay, cool. So I don't need to go scour the internet, do a bunch of reviews and that. It's like the tool knows. So, yeah. Don't laugh, Donnie. I'm still stuck in the part of asking like Bard, like what companies have the open positions right now. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> We're going to awesome, dude. Yeah, it is one of the, it's the, the thing about Bard, obviously the prompts are different. It behaves a little bit different, but it's like GPT, chat GPT, where it's like the more you give it, the smarter it becomes. Right. So you, you like it, when you give that first prompt, it's going to give you every big company. So it's like, oh, well, shoot, I could have just Googled this. Right. But once you start digging a little bit deeper, right, um, there's some other stuff out there uh, that, you know, you can find some of those because a lot of the clients I work with, they try to stay away from the big organizations with all the red tape. Right. They like to go over those medium size with the budgets there, but, you know, they can truly be a partner. And this is where you can kind of find some of those those gems. Um, the other thing I just did today too, which is a little, little bonus is use it for 5,000 fastest growing companies. So you can go to the Inc 5,000 list, but like I was just doing a, a training for a Tennessee recruiting association. So I just use that as an example. like, find me all the, uh, or create me a list of all the Inc 5,000, uh, companies in Tennessee. And it gave me the first 10 and I'm like, okay, well give me the next 25. And then it gave me all that. And I'm like, great, put it into a spreadsheet, Whoa, export into a Google spreadsheet and you already got yourself a workflow of companies you're going to reach out to. I love the Inc. 5000 because that's, they're proud to be growing and typically when you're growing, you're hiring. Uh, another nugget. So 
Is there anything else that you want to say about ways that you could bring inbound leads and use AI for leads like before we move on? Yeah, I mean, I think the big, the last, last thing with the inbound, um, traditionally, uh, with marketing inbound leads came from like lead magnets and things like that, right? Which is, Hey, I've got this free resource for you. You're going to give me your information. And then I'm gonna put you through a campaign. I think that's good best practice. I think that recruiters, especially with using tools like AI chat GPT can put yourself a guide together in a matter of a day, right? Go to Canva and get it designed and boom, you're in business, right? So. Um, you can literally do all that for free now and go get yourself a nice interview tip guide for your candidates in your marketplace to start to separate yourself. But those little resources I will use as a way to generate conversation. So I just never give it away. It's like, Hey, I recently, uh, just wrote a guide about X, you know, it includes boom, 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 boom. Drop me a comment below if you want a copy of that. And then I do that so that I can, I can generate conversation. I'll also use my resources in some of my direct outreach. I usually don't even try to sell. I just try to get people into dialogue. And something I do with my client that we have a lot of success in is we're very rarely going, hey, we see that you're doing this and our company, here's our unique selling proposition, especially on LinkedIn. I don't think people want to be sold. So we go with more of a, a resource approach, very tailored to the audience. And then we ask for permission because people are used to getting spammed on LinkedIn, right? Where you're just all of a sudden getting a leak. So it's like, hey, John, you know, Work with a lot of CFOs on here. We just built out, you know, XYZ guide. Wanted to reach out, see if it's something you'd be interested in. Give me a yes or a thumbs up, I'll pop it over. Now, the reason I do that is because now I can, in order for them to get that, they have to dialogue with me. From that dialogue is where I can set up the phone conversation if there's a need. And I think you literally just walked into the question that I was about ready to ask you, which is kind of funny. It was like, okay, you're, you're now starting to build this content on LinkedIn. You're starting to make it relevant. You're starting to look to try to be that leader in the space, that authority. What do you do when somebody likes it? Or what do you do when somebody comments on it? Do you, I, I, you don't want to go straight into spam mode, but it sounds like you also have tools and resources built out that you can give them. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think you get your traditional content of posting and then building a media resource is, yeah, it, it, the easy place to build a resource is, you know, either A, solve a problem. Um, that your client has, right? So, uh, okay. So let's say they stink at writing job descriptions and you've got the best formula in the world for writing job descriptions. It's like, go create a resource and show them exactly how to create a job description. I think one of the challenges that people face with this, especially in the recruiting industry is they don't value themselves enough. They don't value what they're bringing to the table and they just assume that you know, these companies have everything figured out because, well, they're a big company, so they should have it all figured out. It's like, no, you actually have a hell of an opportunity to be a massive resource to these companies. And one of the biggest ways to get into a company door is like, rather than me tell you how good I am, I'm just going to go ahead and show you. Here's this resource. Somebody should read that resource and go, holy shit, like this is really good. <laughs> I want more of that. Where do I get it? Right. Oh, well, I can help you with that. You know, but the best resource out there that is going to attract attention, to both your clients and your candidates is a salary guide. Every That's candidate hilarious. wants to know what they should be getting paid and every hiring decision maker wants to know what market rate is, right? So you could literally go to market whatever prospecting approach you're reaching out to clients or candidates and use the same guide and you'll get yeses all day long. I will say that salary guide, I've never created one, but it's one of the go-to things in the cleared space. Uh, clearance jobs prints one out and all of us recruiters are just like eating the data. Yep. But. Because we're eating the data, we're back on their platform again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what we want to be the one that creates the, you know, how can you extract and get the data? And that's a, that's a challenge. I mean, I've helped people build these out before. And, you know, you can have some more success with that. Like if you're a bigger firm, um, like the bigger firms, I've coached a couple of firms that are like 30, 40 people. Well, they're getting so many, they're hiring so many people for a year that they can get enough relevant data for their market just from what they're doing from their own hiring, right? But, you know, is Benjamin and his wife going to be able to get enough data for your industry based off of how much you're hiring? I don't know. You would know that, right? So if you can't, then what are the ways we do that? And there's other, there's other resources, there's companies that actually do uh, salary survey type of information, or you go create your own campaign to your network where, again, the cool thing about doing things like this, when you're doing discovery, 
it's such a frictionless way to get in front of an audience. It's like, hey, John, I'm going to be doing a salary survey, you know, uh, for cybersecurity professionals. Uh, I hope to wrap it up here in the next couple of months. It, you know, would that be something you'd be interested in? Start with the ask value out for them for, yeah, it would be. Great. You know what? I'm still looking for feedback. Could you take a few, you know, uh, if I sent you over a one-minute survey, would you take the time to fill it out? Yeah. Go get yourself a Google form. Ask all the questions you want for your salary guide. It's going to, you know, do all the data there for you. And boom, you can build your own salary guide, guide that way. So fantabulous. Now, and shifting gears a little bit, you mentioned this one thing a few minutes ago. Most recruiters don't understand the value that they add. Mm -hmm. How do, how does a recruiter go back and realize what they do and the value that they truly add? Oh man, that's a loaded one. Um, <laughs> So I, dude, I think that that's a big, and I, and I love, I think a lot of that has to do with like, uh, their own self-worth to start. Right. Um, I, I think that that's, if I were going to go real deep, that's where I'd go is like, there's a pocket for a lot of people to kind of find value in themselves, love themselves, so to speak. Um, uh, and so I think that's the underlying, but I think it's, I think going back to what I said earlier, if you start to look at the evidence of your calls, right. Um, and you start to look and I, I'll, there's certain recruiters that probably can't do this, right? Um, uh, probably not very good recruiters. <laughs> um, but like, if you have a pulse in the market and you've been doing this for a while, the thing is, is like looking at the challenges. So like what frustrates you about a certain company's hiring process, for example, how would you fix that? How, how have you seen other companies go about, you know, doing that and what is better? What does good look like? And we sometimes it's educating our market on what good looks like, you know, um, can it, can attract. So, um, but I think that it's, you know, if you, again, if we go deep, it's like, well, finding value in just me as being a, as a human being, or, you know, self-love, so to speak, but then yeah, well, where, where are the areas that I'm already in, getting impact? Where am I getting validation from my market? What is the feedback that my clients are saying? What is the feedback that my candidates are saying? But it's more of just this assumption that these bigger companies haven't figured out. Right. And, um, I think this is a, kind of a part of the challenge of the industry is, you know, a lot of recruiters, I feel like I've interacted with, have this mindset that they're like, you're in business for like, well, it's October, 2023. And so like, this is when I'm in business for it. And very few are like forward thinking, big vision thinking, right. That are really bought into it. And, and the point I make with this is like, well, you know, this about me, Benjamin is like, I was never a recruiter. I learned this shit. And so that's because I had a relentless effort figured out. Now I could probably speak to this industry better than anybody because I could taking the time to do it. So there's that, there's that place to go. Yeah. I don't know everything. I'm gonna figure it out because I'm committed to this. Right. And, and so that's the, that's the part of like, Hey, when I first started this contingent retained, what the heck's that staffing, recruiting, executive search, like I couldn't tell you any of it. Right. And there was times when I was first going on my first sales calls, the guys were just chewing me up and spitting me out. Right. Like, Hey bro, you've never done this before. Have you like, no, I haven't. <laughs> And, you know, for me, I've always just been honest and transparent about that. But my, my big point is, is like, Hey, look, if I can find a way to come into this industry, I knew nothing about and learn things so that I can be a valuable resource, then you can too. And that's the part, that's the part about, Hey, I'm fully committed to, to making an impact on my industry. I'll learn these things. And then I only share value where I'm comfortable, right? Uh, you never hear me talking about recruiting tactics because I'm not a recruiter. I couldn't tell you guys how to recruit. So yeah, market the hell out of your business and blow your brand up for sure. <laughs> but I'm not a recruiter. I stay in my lane. And I mean, what I've seen over the years is a lot of recruiters suck at marketing. <laughs> yeah, and you said it, not me. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 how many recruiting companies actually hire a marketing person? Typically it's zero. They just hire another yeah, sales person. Yep. They do it themselves. It, I always view it as, uh, I always explain it's a box to check. Oh, shoot. Yeah. You know what? I, we do need to do marketing. Oh, yes. People keep on telling me about content. I need to do that. Well, how do I check this box? Oh, well, I'll just hire, a, you know, a, 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 a social media assistant that knows nothing about this industry and I'll have them create a bunch of articles. And then, oh, guess what? I checked the box, but it's not doing anything, but I got that post out. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's always the big challenge is not marketing is usually not the priority, you know, for most, for most recruiting firms out there. And I'll, I'll, I've said this a few times to the listeners, like I put out some LinkedIn articles and a few years later, they're still bringing inbound stuff. So you never know like where this marketing takes you and it, you know, it, yeah. it, it's like, you have to find ways to stand out in 2024. 
you have to find ways to be authentic and you have to find ways to differentiate yourself. And yep. Well, I think it's the thing is, is the way I think it, and I think it's a simple way of thinking is like, it's 2023. You have the ability, like we talked about early on, we have all these abilities now that we didn't have to compete with. The number one thing you have the ability to do is control your own brand narrative. That's fine. You can not post, you can stay quiet. And I'm going to tell whatever stories I want about your brain that I can, you know, or you can post and you can start to share exactly and show people how you want them to view you, what view your process, the results that you deliver, the impact you make on your marketplace. Now, as an, as an individual, it's, it's challenging sometimes because our ego is so attached, right? So there's fear of putting yourself out there. Trust me, plenty of imposter syndrome over here, tons of it, especially early on, right? Tons of fear about putting myself out there. Um, but the thing is like, we don't really have a choice, right? And once we overcome those types of things and then, you know, we can kind of become, you know, um, there's really a lot of magic that can happen from it, right? I mean, from what I've experienced for myself, but I've got a couple of clients, you know, we just got done, you were on my podcast, Benjamin, and we were talking about podcasting, which you've had a lot of success with. I know one of my clients, it's implemented my system, including podcasting, he's returned seven figures annually, just seven figures in additional business purely from his online presence. So it works. If you got, if you're a good recruiter, you got to be good at the recruiting job first, right? To make the money. Right. But if you have the, if you have, you have the brand offline and you're not leveraging it online, you're straight up sitting on gold. You're sitting on gold. Um, and, and that's usually the best place for me to come in and help is like, if you're a seasoned recruiter, right. That, that knows what you're doing. Like we can highlight the heck out of you. So awesome. Well, fantabulous. Before we move on to the next part of the podcast, is there anything else you want to share? You know, um, I think the last thing I'll just kind of close that on the marketing side of it is marketing in what I think a lot of people think of initially, um, that kind of keeps them from doing it is that, um, they have to promote themselves and marketing is really, in my opinion, it's about adding value to your industry. So I went through those three pillars. If you look at those three pillars, I've talked about the connection pillar, but there's nothing about any of those three pillars. Like, oh, well, you got to sell yourself, right? It's like, so if you follow me, like 90% of the content I'm going to put out is pure value add, purely me leading my market. Okay. You know, very rarely am I actually asking for business. Very rarely are you going to say, here's five things that make Donnie different. And so very, very directly, I think is, is when, if you're thinking about marketing, think about adding value to your market. Don't think about promoting your business. There's a difference. Promoting your business kind of goes into the sales category, in my opinion. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. You need to do it, but go 90, 10, 90, 10 marketing, 10% selling. Awesome. 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 All right. Now moving over to the quick fire questions. And when I say quick fire, it doesn't have to be a quick answer. Okay. Okay. So somebody gave a three second. Nervous, man. You got me nervous, dude. <laughs> All right. It's 2024. Our recruiters just getting started at our industry. What advice would you give them based on everything that you've seen with your clients on what they need to do to be successful? Oh, great. First, have a very clear target market. Make sure that this market is, you know, viable, um, you know, that there's business to be had. Competition's good. That's usually a sign that there's business to be had. Um, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, are you passionate about it? Um, especially starting out, you know, the reality of it is, unless you've got finances, you know, you're not going to be scaling quick. So, you know, you're starting a business, but let's be honest, you're starting a glorified job. So since you're doing a glorified job, which there's nothing wrong with that, I've got one of those too. Um, you, you want to make sure you're passionate about it. You're going to be showing up every day, working your ass on something. You're whack, working your ass off on something. You want to make sure that you're at least enjoying that process. So it starts with a the niche. Then, you know, what is your outreach strategy? Do you have any warm connections? Okay. I would want to start with my warm connections first, see if I can get any introductions, let them know that I'm in, in, in business existence. Then I would go into a cold outreach strategy, starting to make more prospects know that I exist. Okay. And one of the things that I think is very important here is just having numbers that you're committed to and attracting. So I don't care whatever you're after. If you're going to cold call, then make sure you're committed to, is it $50 and $100? If you're going to do LinkedIn messaging, how many are you doing? Because the most successful people are consistent with what they're doing and, and they're doing it, you know, over and over and over again with the consistency showing up, but the clarity of action 
um, from what I've seen, especially starting out, will eliminate the analysis paralysis because that's one of the biggest things that people that are starting out is they're questioning, oh, well, I tried this today, it didn't work, right? So find a system that you're going to stick to and then make the system work, right? There's so many different ways out there. There's so many people out there in, this, in our world that can help you. Um, you know, I've got a coaching program. There's so many other great coaches out there, but like find a way, find a system that, that works or take where you were trained before and implement it. So yeah, I think it's, you know, have that market, have clarity of what you're going to do for outreach and metrics. And then, yeah, I would say starting to build a brain right away is going to help you, you know, catapult your business faster, especially if you're serious about this. And fabulous. And kind of like the same question, but for us old dogs that have been around the block a few times, yeah. five, 10, 20, right. What, what, it, the game's changed. What, what are some advice that you would give for us to be successful? Yeah. It's almost the same, Benjamin. Honestly, man, is like I think first is is just the mindset of like, um, uh, it's not an option anymore. It's not an option to have a presence online if you're serious about it, right? Yeah, I think yeah, you mentioned Rich Rosen early on. <laughs> yeah, that guy's got so much whatever coming. There's probably a bunch of other people out there like that where you got a book of business. That's fine, fantastic. But if you're serious, you know, um, and, and you're you're you know going to be around for a while. Um, then having the mindset of like, I've got to be online. I've got to control my narrative. I've got to put myself out there is important. Actually, one of the things that I usually do with, uh, seasoned, you know, recruiters is actually go back and reevaluate that target market because they usually come in with the old school approach, right? So they might be generalists or they might be, um, a little bit more vague on the market and they've had success, but they're like, oh, well, I don't have, I'm not getting traction with my messaging. It's like, well, what's going to connect with somebody in a Fortune 100 company in a medium size is not is going to be an apple and an orange in terms of their frustration. Can you deliver the talent? That's not the question. Can I capture their attention? Two different types of attention I'm trying to capture, right? So re redoing that. And then, yeah, the first low-hanging fruit for you, for those guys is like, let's go to our existing network. We should have a big one. Let's go Let's go tap into that um, and, and just start getting people out of dialogue, though. Don't try to sell people when you're coming back in, right? Um, same thing, then go and build out the cold outreach approach. But the big shift here is that when you get to your content, you have so much more you can leverage. We want to tell those stories. We want to showcase your success. We want to, we want to, you know, start to put, that's where I'm saying you're sitting on gold is we have so much more that we can showcase for your brand right away than if you were starting out, for example. So very similar approach, but little nuances there. I love how you keep on also like yeah, mentioning mapping out your market. I feel like a lot of people don't do that. Oh, most people don't, man. I mean, I'll tell you one of the, one of the sets of feedback is people are, when I get on a call, like doing our sales calls, like, oh, do you have target market? And they'd say it. And then I'm like, yeah, okay, well, we're going to be able to dig deeper on that. Right. And then they go through that exercise and they're like, I've never been through an exercise like that. That's like the best exercise I've ever been through because I've, that's in my program. It's like the heaviest lifting is the actual client avatar because we have like 60 questions. So my clients, like they know their market inside and out and it, it's because. You know, it's like same thing, Benjamin is like in six years, I found a way to become somewhat of an authority in the recruiting space. Six years ago, like I said, I couldn't speak the language, right? But because I'm committed to this, committed to making an impact of the industry and committed to the overall craft, then I continue to show up. And then, man, like here I am six years and I'm on your podcast and we're hosting a train for somebody else. You know, it's like, it's all good stuff happens, you know, it comes to you that way. So. And that goes back into the recruiters that have been around for a while. Like you got six, 10, 20 years of stuff that you can, you can rely on. Yep. Pull right, pull from all that stuff, you know, but yeah, the client avatar in having a clear understanding of your target market is I think the big, big game changer for a lot of, a lot of folks like that. Um, even if they have a good understanding is just going and taking that a, dip, a, a level deeper beat. Where I was going with like some of, with my story too, with that is like, I can probably explain a recruiter's day in hell better than they can, right? Because I've heard it so many different times in so many different ways. And so then I can go out to the market. And so, yeah, if I'm a seasoned recruiter, you can explain your hiring manager's day in hell way better than they can. You've heard the story a hundred times, you know, Hey, are you our cybersecurity professional? Are you tired of sifting through? resumes from external recruiters that just don't even get it? Are you tired of, you know, the next set of resumes coming to your lap and you wanted three and you got five instead and half the, you know, of the five that got dropped on your lap, four of them didn't have the technical qualifications you needed. You need to reach out to your recruiter and he didn't respond back to you because he's working contingently with a bunch of other recruiters in town, right? So it's like being able to speak 
to like paint a story, give them a vision. They're like, oh shit, that's me. I don't want that. <laughs> awesome. Fantabulous. Has there been a book that has had a huge impact on your personal career success? Mm, man. Think and Grow Rich was always one of my favorite books. Um, I think Think and Grow Rich is, is probably my favorite legendary book. Let me look behind to get a little bit of extra inspiration right now. Um, yeah, I think Think and Grow Rich is probably my favorite, um, book around mindset, uh, the power of now, um, now, I mean, for me, man, I'm all, I'm thinking of all the things that I read recently, which is all like mindset, you know, um, meditation, ground, mindfulness type of stuff. So it's all kind of weird or it's like a really weird marketing book. But I'll say another one that's on the business side is uh, Traction. If you guys haven't read Traction, if you guys are looking to scale, Traction is an excellent book if you're looking to scale. Um, awesome. Yeah. So looking at your own personal success and your own personal story, what do you think has been a big driver of your success? Uh, belief. You know, um, I, I just have a big belief in myself and, and I'm committed to doing whatever, you know, whatever is necessary for me to get the results that I'm after. Um, I think it just comes from my background, you know, I, um, played football in college and I was a walk on. So if you know about that, you're basically low man on totem pole. And, and I think that, that kind of mindset's always helped me and, you know, um, coming into an industry where, you know, I didn't have, didn't know anybody, didn't have a ton of experience. Um, there was one person in my corner and that was me, you know, um, and there was, you know, when I first came out there in, especially as I started to become more known, then there was a lot more arrows being thrown at me and a lot more arrow, arrows in the back. And I just had to stay, you know, true and loyal to myself and, and believing what I, what I have, you know, and just cutting out the noise of, of other people and, and just staying focused, man. I knew what I had to offer and, and I believed in that. And, and then I could just continue to polish my skills and polish and try to get better every single day. So. Cheers to the uh, college athlete walk-ons. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. So was I. Yeah. What? Uh, cross country. Oh, nice. Nice. Coach was like, I couldn't, I couldn't run a lap around a, a, a track, but I'm a, I'm a sprinter. I'm a three to five second guy. <laughs> I mean, it, it's kind of funny. It's almost like my recruiting story, like with college athletics. I kept on showing up to the coach's office. She kept on getting annoyed with me and finally gave me a workout plan. And it was just like, I'll never see you again. And then she saw me again and yeah. she's like, well, you're not going to make the team. And then I just kept grinding. She goes, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Now it was, I mean, it was cool. I was, I played at the university of Nevada and I had a coach that kind of introduced me to, you know, another coach there and had one guy that believed in me there. And the same story is like outside of my, my dad, you know, it was me that believed in myself and to go onto campus. I was number 100 to three. So they, you know, we had a hundred and. 15 guys on the team and my locker room number because of the walk was 103. And that's, you know, all my gear, I still have, I saw that in the years is 103 and on my shorts is 103. And like, that's a number 103 is a, is an important number to me because I knew where it took for me to finally put on that 32 on my first game day. So that's yeah. awesome. So looking back at your ups, your downs, everything that you've learned, if you can g have a cup of coffee with yourself, at the very beginning of your career, what would you tell yourself? Yeah, be patient, you know, play the long game. I think I put so much stress on, you know, um, where I wanted to be and, you know, um, I think being patient and kind of having the mindset of, of playing the long game has been, you know, incredibly, incredibly kind of helpful for me more recently. Right. I think early on, especially with this coaching business, like, uh, my ego wanted to preach so many things. Right. And so like I was putting so much internal pressure on myself to where I wasn't really enjoying the ride. And now it's kind of shifted to where it's like, yeah, I'm totally content. Things are good. And like, I'm enjoying the hell out of the ride. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's just kind of playing the long game, being patient and realizing that like very rarely do we hit our ideals and most of the suffering that we go through as professionals or, you know, people that are into, you know, personal performances because we're not hitting our ideal. And so one of the things for me is just celebrating my journey rather than my outcomes, you know, um, has been a massive, massive shift for me over the last, you know, year, um, is just really looking at it from like, Hey, what did I do today to get better from yesterday? And of course, yeah, I set big goals. I set, you know, massive goals and things like that, but 
I don't measure as much off the outcome anymore. I just measure off of who I am as I'm chasing those goals and I'm very intentional about who I'm being. So yeah. Awesome. And how can people get a hold of you, Donnie? Yeah. Check me out on uh, LinkedIn, Donnie Gupton. Um, you can check me out on my podcast, The Relevant Recruiter Show. And then if you want to join the Facebook group, we have the Relevant Recruiter community. So that's where awesome. you can find me. Well, Donnie, before you let you go, is there anything else you want to share with the listeners? Get after it. You know, you guys control your own narrative. You guys get to control your own brand and, you know, branding and marketing should be something that's fun. Um, you know, don't make this a chore. I would, I would encourage any steps, no matter if you're branding and marketing, whatever activities that you're doing to up-level yourself, up-level your professional self, up-level your business, you know, what can you be doing, um, to celebrate your success and journey, you know, along the way, um, as you go about this brutal journey that you're going to go on, but step in, you know, enjoy the process. Um, and whatever you do, and just have a growth mindset. And Tybo Sidani. Well, Danny, thank you so much. Uh, one, I love the actionable insights, uh, especially for many of us. I feel like as recruiters, we're not doing the best job, like selling ourselves, highlighting our stories, talking about how we can add value to the market. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest shifts coming into 2024 on mm -hmm. how you can be a relevant modern recruiter. So definitely thank you for coming on and sharing that. And my mind is blown on using BAR to like build out a, like a, can't, like a client bus. I think I'm doing that like the second I get done. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, that goes, man. <laughs> well, go. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, um, I had a, had a lot of fun with you. I mean, we've had a good couple of hours here, man. So, so this has been a great day. So uh, thank you again for, for allowing me to be on the show. Well, and for the listeners, I wish you guys to crush it. Remember, you are literally one placement away from completely changing your life. So have a great day, guys.